Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 373. Oh, I like that. It works the same way in both directions. Love those shows. For Monday, February 13th, 2023. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab. Welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. We have a new sponsor tonight, Capo, which is a fantastic app that uh, we've actually talked about on the show before. But it helps you learn songs. It makes life super easy. It's not just for guitar players. It's from the super mega ultra groovy folks. We'll talk more in depth about that in a little bit. But for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. You're in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. Paul, I was looking at the news this week and um, si- the company Side Door, which is like a, I, th- I think they're like a ticketing platform of sorts. Uh, they have um, a, an incentive program available. Uh, they're giving 500 bucks to any artist performing at the Folk Alliance International or showcasing at South by Southwest this year. So if you're if you're playing at either one of those, you can apply. We'll put a link in the show notes about this whole thing from Side Door. You can apply for a five hundred dollar uh, grant. Great. I don't Which, understand why they're giving money away. Uh, well, because I mean, I, presumably to, so that well, probably so that uh, people like me are manipulated into talking about it. But it's not a bad <laughs> thing. Like, it's um, not, you, you know, it, it costs a lot of money to go to to do these festivals traveling, you know, for some bands all over the country or all over the world to get there. And so to, you know, knock 500 bucks off the top of that, uh, it probably oh, won't. I get that it's a good thing, but I'm asking, why is this company giving the grants? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe the people who get the grants will say nice things about them. I suppose so. Yeah. Yeah. This is pretty good. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So I'll put the link in the uh, show notes and you you, at giggabpodcast.com. You can go check it out if you're playing uh, any of those events. And I think maybe side door is affiliated with those two festivals. So they want to have more people playing their showcases and all that stuff. So it makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, another surprise this week was that, um, the, the net result of which is that Fling is playing our EP release party on Friday night at the Stone Church here in New Hampshire. There was a band, uh, uh, in fact, some friends of ours, uh, and the, the the horn section from which played on our uh, on one of the songs on our EP, the, the band Rockingham Groove uh, had some issue where they, scheduling issue or something where they couldn't play on Friday night. And so uh, my friend uh, Chip who plays in the band who was opening for them, a band called Low Falutin, called me and said, hey, does Fling want to play this? And we thought, Shh. I said, well, let me check with the guys. It's short notice for Fling. That's really short notice. But everybody was available. And so it was like, yep. And it's our first show here in New Hampshire since we released the EP. So it is our EP release show. We're going to play the entire EP. I mean, it's like only six songs or something, uh, but we'll play it in, uh, in order. Uh, at, at some point during our sets on Friday night, but very uh, cool, good for you guys. Nice, right? yeah, I'm stoked about it. Yeah, it, it should be em. should be good. Yeah, yeah, I love it when uh, I love it when a plan comes together, as as uh, Hannibal on the A team used to say. I think so, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, nice to get back to the Stone Church and uh, it's you know I like it when things just work. So I was stoked that Chip thought of us, and I'm stoked it all sort of worked out. So. Bring it. Yeah. How about you? Did you play uh, this weekend? Well, I did and talk about things coming together. So actually I had, uh, I drove up here, up there, mm-hmm. played a gig, went right to a house rock rehearsal after that full day of work the next day, uh, coffee house gig that night with the little band house rocker gig the next night. And then a winery gig on the way out of town. So I did four in a row. Oh. Um, the house rocker gig, was 
miserable traffic to get to. Everybody missed soundcheck. You know, we got everybody got there just about it. One guy got there about 15 minutes after downbeat, and we just kind of stalled our way to that. But it was two and a half hours drive to get to this place, something that should be 45 minutes. But one of the highways was closed and having construction. So it was just kind of, and it was just exhausting. Uh, but I will say that this was the first time I did, I've, I've done Ford in a row in the past. Sure. I was beat, man. I was, I was, I was tired and my voice was just holding on at the end of the acoustic one on the, on the last day. And yeah. uh, I, I don't think I could have done much more than I did, but it was fun. It was like everything, it was all different, you know, two solo gigs bookended by solo gigs where I play whatever I want. The coffee house band is such fun. And then the house rockers are just, I tell you, man, it's becoming an interesting story. You and I talk before most shows and I kind of, yeah. you know, share my, joys and sorrows of trying to keep this band together i mean it's definitely together and it really i'm kind of reflecting that it's a, a reflection on me one thing that's different is i am definitely easing the reins of my efforts to do things a certain way it's much more like i'm just enjoying it i don't know if this is another has another five years ten years left in it. it's 24 yeah. years this year and um congratulations by the way that's awesome isn't that a good thing that's great i mean yeah. i'm very proud of that you should be yeah 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 absolutely but this is the first time in those 24 years we're like you know what i'm gonna stop being the bad guy you know and, and you know trying to impose a direction on this and literally just whatever happens happens you know song lists i'm, I'm less picky if guys want to do songs that i don't i don't particularly believe in let's give it a try which i guess is making them happy um, but you know, this kind of willful trying to impose a vision, yeah. which I think has been a large part. I like for better or worse, it was a plan. And, and that's often better than, well, it's, it's, it's by definition better than no plan. Right. And so we had a plan Generally, and, I, yes. plan, and I, yeah. I took a fair amount of bullets over time Of course, and, um, you know, for better or worse, could we have gotten farther or, you know, I don't know, but we had a plan and we worked it and, the story that I bring to gig gab to talking about the house rockers is much more like, all right, you know what? I can't be there. The situation has changed. The premise before was I will keep you guys working buy in. Now it's like, it's a good thing. You're going to get good gigs. You're often going to get really good money. You're always going to get some good adoration. You know, people will come out of their way to see us as they did on Saturday night. You're here. It is, this is a, this is, this is free will that is, is what's keeping the band together. And funny, because coming up to this gig, so first of all, we had our first, I told you we had our rehearsal after the first gig on Thursday, after my first gig on Thursday night. Right, so right. So I did a two hour, five to seven acoustic gig, and then ran to this rehearsal, our first rehearsal in a long, long time. So the rehearsal and was at had, night, and then you had a house rockers gig the very next day, correct? No. Oh. Rehearsal Thursday night was five to seven. Got it. No, no. The, my gig was five gig, to seven. Right. Rehearsal was at eight. Okay. That night, okay, yep. Right, and um, sure enough, you know, bass player comes down with COVID, he can't make rehearsal. Oh, no. So, and we don't know if he's going to be able to make the gig. So I have to get a a potential sub ready. Oh. And just to process this whole thing is, in my mind, I'm like, yes, I'm the one who has to figure this out and get a potential sub ready. I mean, I'm thinking about the van band guy who probably has three subs and, you know, every chart and, you sure. know, it's really oh, easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in general, I don't sub my rhythm section because our stuff is just, you know, our, like, you know, our show is just a little hard to sub someone. There's just too yeah. many segues and too many stops and too many, you know, no, things. Your, so, your band, like subbing for your band, whenever I did that, like 10 years ago, or whatever, no, it wasn't 10 years ago because this show hasn't been going on that long, but whatever, you know, <laughs> five pre pre COVID lockdowns. Uh, I, I mean, it was a lot of work to put in mm -hmm. and, and yet still required me to like mind meld with Nick, your keyboard player and, and uh, well, your old bass player, like, th like th the three of us got me through the gig, you, you know, yeah. cause you were, I mean, you're the front man, so you don't, you, you can't, I'm like, not turning around a lot. You're yeah. not turning <laughs> around a lot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but, but like it, it took all, it took a lot of prep and, like I knew those guys too. It wasn't like I just came in and was some nobody, it, you know, they, they, yeah. we had a little bit of a relationship there. Thank goodness. So yeah, that was, um, it was so a, lo it's a lot. It's a lot. So a, a lot. I got to yeah. make some calls and find a guy 
B, I got to get the guy prepped, you know, so I might have to organize some charts for him or at least get, you know, you know, a, 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 a playlist ready for him to listen to. So call a few guys, figure out who's available on short notice, get them prepped, and quite likely would have had to go into pocket a little bit because it was a little bit farther away. And, sure. You know, this was a club date, not, right? And I, and it is very, very clear to me, this is why a leader is supposed to, you know, have some benefit to being the leader, whether it's yeah. financial or song choice or whatever it might be. It was definitely going through my mind that this was work, time that I didn't really have to do this. Anyway, you know, we go, we, we, we do the rehearsal without a bass player. By the way, playing Uptight by Stevie Wonder is not very fun without a bass player. Just going to lay that out there. Um, oh, man, I can only imagine. Oh, yeah. Right? So yeah, yeah. we get, you know, we get started on a couple of new things. We bring back a couple of things. You know, we, it, it was, it was a, it, there was value to still doing what we did, but we didn't do everything we needed to do. Um, the next day, the bass player tells me that, he, so now we're Friday. Yeah. He, the bass player's like, I'm cool. I tested negative. Right. So right. he tested positive starting the Monday before yep. was probably hoping he would be negative by the time of the rehearsal, but let me know the day before. And anyway, so now we're to Friday, right? Go to noon on Friday and my sax player integral part of the band yep. um, is having a family health emergency oh, no. and he asks, you know, can I bail to sub it out? Yeah. Right. So now we're the second guy Friday. So oh. here we go again. So go out and trying to find a guy on one day's notice um, and get him prepped. Right. And so lucky enough, one of the guys we call as a sub, he says, yep, happy to do it. Love to do it. Um, then we got to give him the charts. Yes. I got a pad. I can use a pad. My sound guy goes, Hey, um, you know, we're all on in-ears now. We like, I don't really run monitors. Oh, right. right. So does this guy have in-ears and a wireless mic? Cause we're all on, right. And so, yeah, we could have dealt with it without, but you know, another layer. So I got to go back to the guy. Yes, I have a wireless, you know, so, so he, it was good. And he, he was a good sub, but again, it was another thing leading up to a gig. Anyway, get to the gig. I write the set list, you know, again, last guy, terrible traffic, Last guy gets there about 15 minutes after downbeat. Owner was cool. He knew how bad the traffic was. Sure. So we were okay there. But and the band played very well to a to a at a place where we've been playing for years and people go either out of their way to see us. So it was good. Didn't play perfect. And we haven't played we haven't played for a month. And um added some new things in that we kind of bounced our way through what people seem to like. So, you know, we know that those songs are gonna be good for us. Two, we did um Addicted to Love by Robert Palmer. And um, new sensation by NXS. Huh. I think we talked about it the other day. Yeah, how really did new sensation roadmap. go? Because that's a that's a that's one of those tunes that has to be like you know you got to keep the train on the tracks. Yeah, it it stayed on the tracks. Um, it does have a weird roadmap. Um, the final stop was muffed, but you know by that time we got through the song. And yeah, it was yeah, good. but yeah. we got far enough more familiar to what to listen to. You know the horns kind of tip their our horn chart. If you pay attention, they're t telling you where those stops are. And so it gets a little, you know, but you uh, got to know to listen for it. You gotta, yeah, anyway, you got to know what the cue is for, right? Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So got through it. You know, band was about a seven and a half out of 10. Uh, it's always funny to me when people come out and say, oh, you guys are so tight. It's just funny what people hear and what people perceive versus what you know, you know, what you know you've missed and, you know, all those types yeah. of things. So. We were fine, and it was good. And we're only playing once a month for the next couple of months. And so, you know, my plan is 80 to 85% is the familiar material, and then we'll take a couple chances every night with something new just to keep getting more repetitions in. Yeah. And uh, that's what we did that night. So that was cool. Um, and then, you know, an acoustic gig to get out of town on uh, on Sunday. I did want to say that... It always stuns me when someone who listens to the show sh shows up. I don't know how often you have that in New Hampshire, but I've had it four or five times yeah, no, over it the happens. years that we've been doing it. Oh, yeah. It happens. That's great. Anyway, I'm playing the acoustic yeah. gig on Sunday, and there's this guy who's you know sitting at a table by himself. He wasn't, it was a winery, and I didn't notice him drinking wine, so I figured he's another musician or you know something. Yeah. Anyway, he comes up not too long before I'm done. He goes, hey, I guess you can tell I'm a podcast listener. I said, nope, can't tell what a podcast is a listener looks like. But he was a <laughs> super-duper nice guy, and he was very complimentary about the show. I know 
I know people out there. I mean, we get email and I know people listen to the show, but it still stuns me when someone comes up and is just overwhelmingly kind and nice. And so this guy, um, his name was Drew McGarrity. He, he lives in Huntington Beach. He was up in, uh, in the North County, you know, li- listening, I think, at a family event or playing with a band or yeah. listening to a friend's band. And then on his drive down, he stopped and was nice enough to listen to me, really nice enough to say hi. He's a drummer. He said, I'm like Dave. I said, oh, nobody's like Dave, but uh, okay. But uh, <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to be like Dave. <laughs> <trust> <laughs> yeah. <me>. <laughs> anyway, so Drew McGarity, if you're out there somewhere in Huntington Beach, California, thanks for saying hi. Amazing. It was really nice to meet you. It's, it's like one of the best things about doing, I mean, I love our weekly talks. I yes. mean, we would do this even, even if the record button wasn't on, but it is really fun when a, you know, a nice musician comes up and, Let's us know they get something out of it or they get a laugh out of it or whatever whatever purpose it serves for people is pretty cool. But that that was kind of a highlight of my weekend. Oh, I love that sound because that sound means I get to tell you about our sponsor. This week is Super Mega Ultra Groovy, which is a name you might not know. But they are the folks behind a name you probably know because we've mentioned it a few times here on the show, Capo, which is my go-to app for learning music by ear. Without capo, like, things are frustrating, right? Music and video players make it hard to move around in a song or find exactly the right spot that you want to hear. And if you can change the playback speed, it often sounds terrible. Well, that's where capo comes in. It gives you song-learning superpowers. For precise listening, you can use capo's transcription playhead to tackle solos in bite-sized chunks. And when you slow down your songs, even at a quarter speed, they still sound great. And that's because capo was built using high-end studio-quality audio stretching technology. But I've barely scratched the surface. Capo also lifts chords, detects beats, and so much more. And, you know, I know the name Capo is sort of a guitar-centric name. Capo is not just for guitar players. Heck, I'm a drummer, and I use Capo. In fact, the developer Crisp plays guitar, piano, and even some drums and bass as well. And the app can show simplified piano chord diagrams, or you can show just chord names, so it sort of makes it instrument agnostic, or you can completely eliminate the chord display if, uh, if you know, you're a drummer and you don't need to care about that stuff in that moment. And speaking of it, that chord recognition engine is super nuts. It took Chris, their developer, a few years to build the latest version entirely in-house. And as far as we know... It's the best one out there that runs locally on your device, and it's crazy. It can recognize more than just like major, minor. It catches inversions, all of that good stuff. But here's the best part. Capo gives you all these tools completely free. There's no account to create, no ads, and no sneaky trial subscriptions. You have nothing to lose. Head to capoapp.com or search for Capo in the App Store to download it for your Mac, your iPad, or your iPhone. Again, that's Capo by Super Mega Ultra Groovy. C-A-P-O-A-P-P dot com. And our thanks sincerely to Chris and Super Mega Ultra Groovy for sponsoring this episode. So, Paul, a couple of weeks ago, when I got back from Italy, you asked me if I had seen any bands or had any like musical experiences. And in the moment, I, well, I shared the one thing about the, the guy playing Christmas songs on that serendipitous day, which was awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh my, we were over there because my daughter's boyfriend uh, plays pro hockey. He's a professional hockey player for an Italian team. And uh, we went, we, we got to go to one of his games, which was great. Uh, we were coming back in to the arena from the bar. Of course, there's, there's a, there's a whole routine. The period ends, you go to the bar, you get a drink and you go back to the arena for the second period. And as we were coming in to sit down, What's playing on the, the, uh, the, you know, the PA, but sweet Caroline. And this is in, in the middle of the Dolomites, like Northern Italy <laughs> used to be Austria. And everyone is doing all the chants in time and everything. And I was, I, I mean, it was like, okay, well this happens here. Okay. That's fine. And I looked at my daughter and she just shrugged. She's like, yep. And I couldn't help but remember and I, I, I should have looked to figure out the exact date, but it was probably 15 years ago was the first time we played Sweet Caroline in the Macworld All-Star Band. And it, for people who don't know, the Macworld All-Star Band was uh, a bunch of us from all over the country that would play at Macworld Expo, which traditionally took place in San Francisco. So obviously on the West Coast. Uh, the first time we played it, our bass player from New Jersey, Chuck, uh, was the one who suggested it uh, for the band. And when we, uh, when we were rehearsing it, I, you know, I just said to Chuck, I said, we're going to do the stops. He's like, yeah, we'll definitely do the stops. And I remember you and, and Chris, our, our California 
contingent. Like, what are you talking about? Like it, that, <laughs> that it, it just hadn't made it that far across the country yet. Uh, at least not in a way that either of the two of you had, had encountered it. Now it just seems like it's ubiquitous everywhere to do the, you know, the bop, 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 and the so good, so good. And, uh, and so I, it, I just said, well, you know what, just we're going to stop in the in the choruses. Follow me. The crowd, there's enough people from Boston here because the company that that ran or that uh, that that owned Macworld Expo was was a Boston based company. I said, eh, there's going to be enough people there. Like, it's going to work out. It's going to be fine. And it was. But I'll never forget the look on, on your face and Chris's face when the crowd starts then with, a, you know, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> it was so it was interesting to see the the evolution of Sweet Caroline has now it's a global thing. I like I, I don't think there's cultural any, appropriation, right? It, yes, it was cultural appropriation. Yeah, the the, the people of Boston are uh, are uh, wicked pissed. So that's uh, I don't know. No, actually, they're not. They're probably really happy about it. But um, it was just one of those interesting little kind of moments. It's like, wow, this really happened kind of fast. It's a it's a global village we live in, Paul. It's a global village. That was before there was a global village or just beginning of it. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. The beginning of the global. You're totally right. Yeah. Um, my, my wife went to give blood. I'm, I'm in, I'm in like random tidbits mode here tonight, but my wife went to give blood recently and you know, they, they stand up these, these uh, blood drives, you know, centers. They, I think this one was like at a unused storefront in a shopping mall, um, which might be a great place to like throw a weird party too. <laughs> anyway, it gives me an idea. Anyway, um, yeah. Huh. Anyway, so she's at the blood drive and, you know, you sit there for a little while and you give blood. I, I, so I've heard I am I, I, I am chicken. I've never given blood. I, I'm not sure if I ever will. I know really? I'm supposed to. Yep. I'm super chicken about all this stuff. Uh, I was brave recently and I watched them put the needle in my arm when they had to draw blood for like, you know, tests like for the physical or something. But that that was a lot for me. So um, I like. Uh, maybe someday I'll I'll do the right thing and and give blood, but that day. Well, I mean, you're you're no no use to anybody if you faint on the thing. So correct. Don't, yeah, I would Cor- say don't sweat it. Well, you know, yeah, I, th- I think I'm like universal donor or something, so I probably should be, you know, helping mm. out the society. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> maybe I should cut this part out of the show. Um, no, I won't. Uh, but anyway, she was there, and you know, you, you're there for a little uh, for a little bit of time, and she noticed that you know they were playing '80s music. And she happened to ask, like, wh- why? Or the, con- the, con- the conversation came up, like, you know, it's always 80s music at these things. And one of the women that was, you know, facilitating things as part of the Red Cross said, uh, or on behalf of the Red Cross said, oh, yeah, y- you want to know why? And she says, yeah. She says, so the Red Cross standardized on 80s music for all blood drives because, in their estimation, the 80s were the last decade where you could just pick a random sampling of, you know, the, the top 100 or, or whatever. And you wouldn't have any songs with like filled with curse words. And sure, sure. There's like double entendres and stuff in the lyrics. Cause it's all just sex, drugs and rock and roll. But in general, sort of, you know, family friendly, universally either like few people truly hate eighties music. You either don't care or you like it, you know? And, and so it's sort of universally tolerated and, I just found that really interesting and, and, and she's not wrong. I mean, certainly there's plenty of songs from the nineties and all the way through that, that would fit what they're looking for, but they would have to be more intentional about selecting out, you know, the ones that don't fit. Whereas with the eighties, you just pick it and good to go. Let the playlist go. (laughs) Yeah. They'll let the playlist go, which I I thought was interesting. Um, I mean, we're at a time now where cover bands like eighties cover bands are doing very well because it's, it's a nostalgic thing. Um, you know, and, and so that's also a good thing, but, um, but yeah, I just thought that was, that, that was an interesting observation, at least on, on the part of the Red Cross. I mean, we can, we can yeah. dissect it and disagree and pick the minutia apart, but it's just an interesting, um, they know decision. Yeah. They would know. They would know. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's interesting. Um, you know, I, I had a, another one of these interesting experiences Saturday morning, we had a fling rehearsal and uh, it, it had been scheduled for a while. And then like two days before the rehearsal, we had this, the, you know, we found out that we were doing this gig uh, at the church on Friday and it had been a while since we had really played like electric and, and there's uh, several songs, including one on the EP that we've never played live before. 
um, it, it, it really kind of became a, a studio originated track and, and a studio originated track that happened with all of us separate, you know, it was, it was just recorded. We each kind of recorded our parts in our own places and then assembled it together, uh, a tune called Saturday tomorrow. And so, uh, the, the, the purpose of the rehearsal changed very quickly to, okay, well, let's put together our, our set list for the gig and then let's play through whatever we need to play through to, to feel confident going into this gig. And we only had, we had less than two hours to rehearse just because of some um, scheduling issues with, with various band members. So we were very focused on rehearsal and it was very, you know, efficient and all that stuff. There was one song that I would have wanted to play through a tune called kicked in the nuts that we do that. I just, I just haven't played it electric in a while um, I sing it and it's, I also crafted this like really sort of bombastic drum part for it. And it's just, I need the reps on it before I go and do it in front of a crowd. And I didn't get to, we didn't get to that. And I was like, that's fine. Like I have a recording of it. I can play along with it. It's I'm, I'm going to be fine for the gig. Like no problem. And then I got in the car to drive for like three hours, uh, down to see uh, some family and a friend down in, in Connecticut. And so I thought, well, let me put on the, the, I'm going to put on the new EP and and I'll listen to that. So I did. I listened to it. And I was like, okay, yep, good. And we just played a bunch of these songs, but I'm I'm re-cementing. I'm like, well, I should go listen to the EP with Kicked in the Nuts on it. Our, 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 I guess that was our second EP, if I'm not mistaken. And I listened to that. And then I listened to our first one. And then actually I went back and listened to our third one, our most recent one again. The evolution of the sound of this... I, at the time, I was happy with each of them. Um, at the moment, I'm really happy with the sound, the mastering, the mixing of our our current, you know, our most recent one, Uncorked. Like, it it stands up. It sounds as good as anything else you would listen to out there. The other ones kind of sound like demos to me. Like, I, I as soon as I started listening, I was like, oh, I want another crack. I, I like, I might need to go and remaster these. Like this, this needs to get fixed, but, but it's, it's interesting listening through and how much we've learned. Cause we, we did these mixes and masters ourselves. Uh, the, the, the current plan that we've sort of evolved into is that Russ leads the mixing and I'm kind of his sounding board for it. We all are, but I, I make sure that I play that role. And then I do the mastering with Russ and everybody else as my sounding board for that. And uh, I, I use new tools now. I think I think certainly for the first one, I, I used Lurson Mastering Console, which is a a decent mastering suite, but it's it's pretty simple, which was a good way for me to get started. Now I've moved into Isotope's Ozone, which is far more flexible, but uh, like I've actually learned how to use the tool in a way that, that serves us very well. And it's come together quite nicely, but, um, but yeah, it's just, you know, it's one of those things that listening back and, and kind of dissecting oh, your, your, pre your previous work. Chops. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. a lot of people can't even listen to their work, right? I mean, you put all this effort into it, you've changed it, you've tweaked it as you're creating something. And yeah. I think, I think you've heard it so much over time. It's hard to, it's hard to see it for a while. And sometimes you need to go away for a while, then you can come back and, and objectively listen to it. Sometimes it takes a long time to listen to something that you've created. Sometimes you can never do it. I heard, yeah. I've heard a lot of artists who just literally can't even listen to their own stuff. Yeah. I was shocked that I made it all the way through Uncork, the most recent one, the one that we just put together. Um, and I mean, we put it together over the past year, so it's not like all of it's brand new, but some of it is brand new, you know. And I was I was shocked that that I not only made it all the way through it, but was like really, I was happy listening to it. I was, I was like, "Wow, we did a pretty good job on this." Like, I pat myself on the back cool. a little bit. That's yeah, be a good feeling. Yeah, and then and then I listened to our first one. I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, this sucks. Like, this sounds <laughs> terrible." But at the time, you know, satisfied something, right? Uh, it and it, it's a learning process. Like, I I my my the real question I have for myself is you know, give me whatever it is a year, however long it takes us to do the next one. But, but whatever it is, you know, how much better than this is the next one going to be? And at this point in time, I don't, I mean, I don't mean to sound egotistical. I hope that we find ways to make it better, but I don't know what those are. I can't identify them yet. Uh, I, but I want to keep evolving our chops, but, but I mean, at some point you start to, to hit the, the law of diminishing returns, right? Um, 
So I don't, I don't know that I don't know what I would change, I guess is what I'm saying. I, I feel like we've done a really good thing with where we've gotten it, but who knows, you know, time has the uh, benefit of, of affording us some wisdom. And so maybe the next yeah, one will absolutely. sound better. Yeah. So it's fun though. It's fun though. It's a, I like the process. So, and I'm, I'm actually excited about the next one, which when Russ listens, so hi Russ, uh, he'll be really, he'll, he'll get right on me about, okay, we'll go record drums for this song and let's get this going. Let's get this guy. He'll, he'll capitalize right on that, which is smart. God bless because, Russ. Yeah, no, I'm super dramatic about the whole recording thing. And I'm sorry to all of my, uh, bandmates about that. I, I really can, like, I have to be in the right mindset to do it. Once I'm in the right mindset, I, I like, I get on a tear and I go, but it can take me days or even weeks until I find that moment where it's like, yeah, I have, I mean, it might only take me 15 minutes to, to like record whatever I need to record, but to do that, like in the middle of the day in between work meetings or whatever, I, I rarely can like put myself in that place. So I don't know, just, I need to be like energized and ready to focus. And I don't know. I, 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 I am my, my, sort of default direction with music is playing live. It's not the studio. I enjoy the studio, but I am not driven to be like recording things. And that's be either or, right? Well, no, but I'm just saying for me, like I, I will, I will like back burner studio stuff. If I have live stuff to focus on, it's just my, it's just my makeup, right? It's, it's how I am. And so, um, but once I get, once I get into doing the recording and the mixing and the mastering, I'm like super into it. I enjoy the heck out of it. I just, if I've got, you know, live stuff to play, I am, there's no part of me that says, Oh, wouldn't it be fun to do recording? It's like, no, no, just play the live stuff. Like that stuff can sit. So I don't know. It's how it goes. I get it. Yep. Yep. Um, where are we on time? I had, I had a, do you have anything else? I have one little thing I wanted to ask your opinion on. I wanted to kind of Bring share. It on. All right. So we've talked here about, and I still agree with this sentiment, how bad it is to cancel. Like once you're booked for something, if you cancel, there is that, that sort of very obvious risk that you won't be invited back by that person ever again. And, and that this could be, canceling you know if, if like i'm booked for a gig and i say i i'm gonna take another gig or i'm not gonna be around that night you got to get a sub or whatever like that's bad and then also just as a band booking a gig and and then calling the club and saying hey by the way uh you know i know three months ago we put all this together but uh next month we're not we're not around you know we're going on vacation so we can't play the gig you got to figure it out right like that's i i, I it, it is that's it's bad. it's just right it's like so to me, so obviously bad that I, I just my very nature is to avoid having to finding myself in a position where where that's going to happen. Right. I mean, sometimes you do. And I hate that. Like, I'm so against it just at the fiber of my being. There's this club we play. I've played out a bunch and uh, they are do, were doing some they, they kind of announced sort of on their Facebook page or whatever. They're doing some renovations. And I looked and I'm like, well, that means that like, I'm pretty sure they're not going to be done for the next gig. And the the way they described the renovations, it was like, well, I don't even know that they're going to have bands after they do these renovations. And we've got gigs booked for, every, you know, once a month for the next four months or something. And so I reached, reached out to him and I was like, Hey, you know, uh, I, I see the renovations. I'm guessing, you know, the, the next gig on whatever date, might be impacted by this. And they're like, Oh yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're changing the whole thing and we're not, we're not going to be having bands anymore. But and it was like, that's really interesting. Like, there was no, it was just like, well, yeah, we're just changing the business and, and it's fine. Yeah. And I was like, okay. So, and it, it, it's, it is what it is. Like it's, it's fine, but, but it was just a weird scenario to be in. And there was one date in particular where I had, like carved my life around that date so that I would be here to play this gig, you, you know, and it's, 
I mean, look, we're not saving lives with these gigs. If you have to cancel, you cancel. Like it's in the grand scheme of things, it's not a big deal. But to me, it is a big deal to cancel. And so it's like, wow, okay, I'm I'm assigning a lot more weight to this than that particular club owner is. But I also know that like I've talked to that club owner and they're about other musicians and I've heard them say, oh, well, I don't hire that band anymore because they canceled on me a bunch. And it's like, okay, huh? It's just, I don't know. It, there's a, there's a, it's not a balanced scenario was sort of the, the message that I got out of it. And it, it's not a complaint. It was just an observation. It was like, oh, am I putting, no. am I putting too much on this? Or is this just how it is? And I need to. You can extract this out in so many ways. Right. Yeah, exactly. So there's a club that we play that um, it got bought. Yeah. The old guy who owned it. I think I, I, I would say I understood him and he was reasonably predictable to me. I mean, it was a business and he didn't want to lose money. He didn't want to, you know. Sure. But but his word was pretty good, right? Yep. He sold it to a guy whose word is not that good. And this guy made a big deal about I'm bringing live music back and I want to, you know, we're going to be a big thing. And um, um, there's not bands who can draw every night. And he puts it on the bands yeah. to do the draw, right? Yeah. yeah. And all of a sudden, you're seeing like a couple DJ nights going on, right? And all of a sudden, you, you can just kind of sense where it's going. Yeah. And, but, right. it, but it's a guy who I knew, you know, this, get what you can while you can, right? Because this is not going to be forever. And the, the, what's the old saying? If you want loyalty, get a dog, right? I mean, I just, <laughs> I, it's, it's a pretty rare thing when, when you know, everybody is kind of in it for themselves in a way that's incredibly healthy because that's reality. Because it's and in just a way, reality. It's incredibly sad. It, it, which you is know, like, also reality. Like literally, that's right. If if, yeah. if a if a club owner was was willing and able to discern the types of things that could make him money or go, for, but I guess you just see it over and over again, right? Yes. You have a couple bad weeks. Uh, you know, I'm going to get some less expensive bands. Yep. Less expensive bands. Worse experience, not a not a real music club anymore. You know, it's a race to the bottom. Dominant. Suddenly, right? Yeah. It is. It's a that's a great way to put it. It's a race to the bottom. And so mm-hmm. this is. I get. I get why. I as a band leader have been often surprised and disappointed by professional musicians um, making what I would say is perhaps in the moment the best decision for them but also making decisions that would make me not want to want work with them in the future. Yeah, short And I have a bit of a future. track record. Yeah. Right? Well, that's the thing. I have a bit thing. of a track record, so, so yep. I know, right? Yep. And so I, I think it was once upon a time there was a guy who, who subbed out a house rocker gig before we had kind of gotten where we were going mm. um, a day before because he got a better offer. A day before. Oof. And I, I said, I will never call this guy again. And I will let anybody know, don't call that guy. Cause he, he's, he's capable of doing this. He, he's so, willing to do this. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's the thing is, is that, I mean, that's what keeps me from, I mean, there's times and I'm sure this happens to everybody. I, I certainly don't want to put myself out there on some kind of weird pedestal. Like it, but, but you know, living in Dave's head, there's times where it's like, Oh crap. Like, you know, opportunity cost, right? I have this gig on the calendar, Another thing, not necessarily another gig, but just another life opportunity shows up and it's like, well, I really can't do that, uh, you know, and, and even the reverse is true with, if I've got like some business travel or family travel or whatever, and a gig comes up and I have to say no to it. I know that if I do that too much, not canceling, just saying, just declining, I know that my phone number moves to the bottom of the list for good but- reason. Like I well, get there's it. two things. One, yeah. there's the there's the concept of leverage. Who really has the leverage? Who has the leverage? Right. right. Yeah. Like you know, can you cancel because you know you have the leverage that you can? Sure. You can repair that, or or not, or does the club have the leverage, or the venue have the leverage because there's ten thousand people trying to get into that club? Right. Right. And then there's the then there's the concept which I ascribe to myself, which is I really like to sleep at night. Uh, you know, I, I well, really that's not, it not for me. Too. I really not not screw people, and and you know, my reputation means something to me, yeah. and I try to be you know a stand up guy as as often as I can, 
you know, it, something has to happen because my reputation matters to me. Yep. I, it does. That seems to be a game of situa situational ethics among music <laughs> business people. Situational that seems ethics. seems to go around, yeah, no, right? you're right. Well, yeah, God, yeah. you know, listen, hey, I'm, I'm so, but what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know, it's a hard business decision. Well, you know, and if you have the leverage, you say, well, if you're going to make that hard business decision, you might make it again. It's like people, what, um, yeah, we, you have a date, we have a date on the calendar, right? And I am not hearing the type of commitment from the person who booked us. I'm not seeing them promote the date. Yeah. Like, like a pink flag is going up. Right. Okay. And this hasn't happened in a while, but if they were to call and say, oh yeah, we just didn't get together. You know, we're not going to be able to do that date. Right. 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 Contracts and guarantees aside, let's just set that aside. I, there's three guys in my group now who, you know, make their living off of playing music. You cancel a Saturday night and it can't Oof. be replaced. That's just not a cool thing to do. Right. Yeah. And, and I find far too many people that are cavalier about those types of decisions. And you, you choose carefully. Like I said, I watch the gigs. Mostly I know who we're booking with. And if we do something with someone new, if it's, if, you know, if it's a, if it's a private, I'll definitely get a deposit and okay. our contracts, you know, say non-refundable, but you know, not, not every gig is, is contract. Maybe it is, but you know, club dates, you kind of go, I, I know. we've had, we've had this discussion. Do you get a contract for every club date you do? I don't know too many people who do. You are a little bit going on trust and a handshake, at least to my, to my experience. Yeah. Yeah. You agree for club dates? Yeah. Yeah. Club dates are, are, are handshakes. Yes, for sure. Yeah. 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 yeah for, anyway, for better and for worse. You can just kind of tell yeah. if, if they randomly are like, yeah, you know, oh, we're, we're not going to be open. Or like, if I hear about a band that gets booted because a private party, you know, booked the place, more money for the guy. Once you see that behavior, you make a character judgment and you figure out what you want to do about it. That's, yeah. that would be my gig gab advice to musicians out there is like, keep your freaking eyes open and, you know, make a character judgment about who you're dealing with. Don't always go on faith, um, you know, read the tea leaves and, you know, when so and the best say, when someone tells you who they are, believe them. Believe them. That's right. Yeah. It was just, it was just an interesting thing dealing with this one scenario because I, I guess, I guess part of me was surprised that they were so laid back about it. Like it was just like, Oh yeah, obviously, you know, we're moving in this direction. And so all this stuff we have on the calendar is canceled. Like they didn't tell us it, it would have been different. I suppose. I mean, I had to call and ask and they're like, well, yeah, obviously like, okay, well, you know, we had this calendar, like it would have been good to talk, but that didn't surprise me quite as much as my reaction to it, because my reaction was like, yeah, okay. Like I'm just going to take it. And then, I was thinking about it probably while I was driving or something. I'm like, well, wait, why am I okay with it when it happens that way? And I'm not okay with it. If I'm the one in charge of, of, you know, delivering the cancellation, like I, I don't do it. I avoid it. Why, why do I agree with this double standard? Sure. Like, that was the part of it that sort of resonated with me. It's like, um, not a double standard. It's, 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 it's kind you of a like double to sleep standard. at night. Yeah. No, I mean you have your standards, right? right but I was so, okay with their standard being different. I think like, that's mm. the part. It's like I wouldn't do that to them, but but it, like when they told me, I was like, yeah, okay, like makes sense. It, yeah. Not not. I mean, I said that to them, but I also internally was saying the same thing. I wasn't like these freaking guys, but you know, outside <laughs> I'll be a nice guy. Like I was a nice guy. I was like, yeah, this isn't a big deal. And then a couple of days later, I was like, wait, 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 why am I not fuming about this? Like I, this is. Yeah. Like, it's just interesting, uh, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's because I've, I've worked with this particular, you know, club for a while. And so, you know, as we say, everybody gets one, you know, you, you, everybody gets one, everybody gets one. And I, like, I certainly subscribe to that philosophy. So maybe that's why I was okay with it. Like, okay, well, they're going through a lot. I see how it could be that they just sort of fell off their radar. I guess. I don't know. Just, just interesting. It's fine, but yep. yep. I should be more irate, Paul, but I'm, but I'm not. And that's, that's why I brought it up. So, yeah. And maybe, you know, I guess the question that I now I'm asking myself is, 
well, I, you know, is there a difference between like Dave, the drummer canceling on the band versus the entire band canceling on a gig? Like, like is that received differently? I, I don't know. It's, I don't, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same thing. I mean, if I think so, but if your band, if your band has the value system that gigs are, you know, fungible. not real things. Yeah. yeah fungible. That's the word. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're the only guy in the band that thinks it is not, you're probably not going to have a very good time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, God forbid you're the guy who has to go defend the fungibility of it. The fungibility. The... There it is. <laughs> I love this. Uh, that's great. Yeah. What's your band's fungibility? That's uh that's not a bad question. It's not a bad question to ask. I don't know, man. I don't know, but that's the question. Funny business. It's, it's a weird, it business. is a weird business like that. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Yep. 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 Yeah. People's ethical lines are all over the place and it's always, it's, it's almost humorous to watch when people twist themselves into, you know, conniptions to defend a, a really bizarre ethical line. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this business is full of weird ethical lines, right? Yeah, for sure. Some, some more tolerable than others, but yet there they all are. So, mm. yeah. All right. Well, that's what I got for today. You got anything else, man? No, nope, it was a good weekend. I got another full weekend here. I'm going to see Springsteen in Portland. Uh, oh, nice. And the next week, which I'm crazy excited about. Is that at the Moda and Center or whatever? It is. Yeah, and okay. uh, yeah. he had, he had three people out with COVID for his last show. Oh, yeah, Golly. So it's everywhere, man. It's, it's everywhere. Still, yeah, it's still bananas. Yeah, I, I mean, we're over it. We're not over it. It's, it's yeah. What did you know. I? What did I see? Um, the the town of Durham, which is where I live, because I tell you that at the beginning of every show, folks, uh, announced that they are seeing the highest levels of COVID in wastewater that they've seen in two and a half years. And but the, the the concept is you're either vaccinated or you're not. And if you're vaccinated, you're probably not going to die. So we can't stop the world again. Right. I, you know, I think it's, I, yeah, I think it's like, I mean, even just taking the, the vaccine thing out of it. I, I mean, I think it's we're we've chosen to live with COVID now I, is, is what that. Well, we haven't though. This that, guy had Springsteen just played three guys wouldn't take the stage. So they're yeah. not. Well, but what I mean is, COVID. is we've chose. well, that's probably an insurance thing. Like if someone is known to have COVID, like those, those I, I've talked to some people in the, in, at that level of the industry and they're like, oh yeah, everybody's still tested every day, but it's mandated by the insurance company uh, that, that underwrites the tour. Correct. And so it. if it, you know, th like the worst thing would be if the headliner, like, 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 like it, the name brand. So AKA Bruce gets COVID because then the show cannot go on. Right. The show <laughs> I guess in their estimation can go on if members of the E street band are, are not present. But if Bruce isn't present, I think you'd have a hard time convincing people Everybody they got the show that they paid a whole for. bunch of stuff. Yeah. Right. right. Got it. So I, I think that's where that part of it comes from. But beyond that, I mean, like I was at my eye doctor today, nobody's wearing masks or anything in doctors. Like it's, we, we as a society and at, at that level have just chosen to live with COVID. I mean, some people, there are there are exceptions to that. There are some folks who either are always wearing masks or not leaving their homes because they have some concerns that related to risk factors or whatever, like whatever whatever it is, like they they choose not to, and that's I mean it's fine. But I think otherwise we've all just chosen to live with it. I certainly have, but it, it seems like most people have. I mean, we're playing gigs, we're doing things, and going to concerts and going to movies and getting the heck out of our houses, which you know. I saw I saw something the other day where they, you know, I, I've I've always I know I did it earlier in this episode. the The time when we stopped going anywhere, I've referred to the language that I use for that to describe that is COVID lockdowns, right? You know, we had our lockdown. I read something the other day that that sent like you know it made the hair on my arm stand up because it referenced the stay at home order. I had completely forgotten about that mm -hmm. phrase. And when I saw it, it was like, oh yeah, that's right. Oh man, that was heavy duty. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So world stopped for a while. 
Oh, it sure did. We yeah. still did our show. We still did our show. Yeah. Thank goodness <laughs> for that too. Yeah. All right. Oh, wait, one more thing. Yeah, man. My pal, Nick, keyboard player in the house rockers. Yep. Happy birthday, buddy. Mm. Happy Wishing you all the best. Day. Yeah. A pleasure. What? 18 years we're playing together. You got this amazing Frank Zappa cover band tribute band thing that you're doing and you turned it into a success. Just total respect. Good for you. Great player. Great guy. All the best. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Nick. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a good guy. Great player. Great singer. Good guy. Yep. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com is what, uh, that's where you're going to send in your thoughts, your uh, whatever it is. You can yell at us. You can tell us about your band's fungibility. You can do whatever you want. But what are they supposed the fun, to be doing? Putting the fun in fungibility. <laughs> Always, Always be performing. performing.